Well, we are going to jump right into the lesson for tonight. Again, thank you for being here for our November session on Hebrew Foundation. And one of the things that hopefully we're doing through these sessions that we're, we're doing on Hebrew Foundation is we're connecting what we commonly know is the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we see how they're interwoven together. And hopefully you're beginning to see that Christ literally is throughout the Bible from the very first verse of Genesis 1-1 all the way to the book of Revelation. And hopefully you're seeing how connected they are and how dependent the New Testament is upon the Old Testament. Now, something that really a lot of people in the church today shy away from is teaching from the Old Testament. And uh, honestly, I believe that grieves the Lord uh, because without the Old Testament, the New Testament doesn't make any sense. It has no legitimacy. Um, there's really no foundation to it. Everything that we read in the New Testament, the New Covenant, has its roots and its really its conception from what we call the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. And if I was to ask people in this room, who is the greatest writer in the New Testament, I think it would be unanimous that the Apostle Paul was, undoubtedly. And the reason why the Apostle Paul had the understanding that he had and was able to articulate in ways that even Peter marveled at. Even Peter, someone who hung out with Jesus for three years, marveled at the teaching of Paul. But the reason why Paul was able to teach the way he was and expound on the mysteries of God and the things of God is because Paul was a student of what we call the Old Testament. He was very versed. He had devoted his life to the study of the Torah and the prophets and the writings, and he was just immersed in not only the Old Testament, but the other writings of that day. Some of the writings which we have found uh, because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that is a valuable addition and insight into support for the Old Testament and the teachings of the Old Testament. And that's why Paul was able to articulate uh, in a very unique way, and I believe that's why God used him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. I want you to think of it this way. The New Testament is simply this. It is spirit-inspired commentary on the Old Testament and how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Does that make sense? The New Testament is literally the Holy Spirit unveiling the authors to the truths of the Old Testament and how they truly were all about Christ, the plan of redemption and the plan of God to restore humanity from the effects of the fall. But sadly enough, in a lot of churches, they're not teaching the Old Testament. And I think when we, when we don't teach the Old Testament, uh, we're missing out on a big portion of the Scriptures. How many of you know Paul never referred to the New Testament as Holy Scriptures? Not one time. How many of you know when Paul wrote all of his writing, there was no New Testament? Anytime you see the Apostle Paul refer to Scriptures or the Word of God, every time, without exception, he is referring to the Old Testament. Jesus, obviously, during Jesus' life, there was no New Testament, right? But he quotes from the Old Testament countless times. He quotes especially from the book of Deuteronomy, which is part of the Torah. He quotes from the Psalms, which is part of the poetry of the Old Testament. And he also quotes a lot from the book of Isaiah, which is part of the prophetic writings. So we see if 
if Jesus quoted the Old Testament, how many of you believe that carries some weight? And if everything Paul wrote was based on the understanding that he had of the Old Testament, that carries weight too. And I, I want to show you a reminder, and I, and I believe it, it is for all of us, even to this day, of something that Paul explains to young Timothy, who would follow in his footsteps. Timoth Timothy is going to literally take the baton for, from Paul. Paul knows that he is about to lay down his life. He knows that. If you, if you read uh, the book of 2 Timothy, the, the, the last thing that he wrote. And some of the last words that he gave to young Timothy was this. He said, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. What's he referring to there? The Old Testament. Notice what he says about the holy scriptures, the Old Testament which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know what Paul was telling Timothy? He said, continue in what you've learned through the Old Testament, and through that alone you can find faith in Christ Jesus. If all we had was the Old Testament, that's enough to find the, the redemptive plan of God and to find Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So when we read the Old Testament, we should be looking for Christ in everything that we read. Because truly there are types and shadows that are without number that span across the Old Testament that are revealing what Christ would fulfill in either His first or His second coming. Okay? Okay? He also says this in chapter number 2 and verse 15. This is a command to, to Timothy as a minister of the gospel. He said, study to show thyself approved, acceptable, fit unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, we've done establish that the word of truth and the Holy Scriptures that is used in this context is referring to the Old Testament. So he's telling Timothy, if you want to understand the things of God in full, then you need to study the Old Testament to show that you're even fit for the pulpit or fit for the ministry so that you're not ashamed when people ask you questions like, well, what are we supposed to do and how are we supposed to live? This is what the law of Moses says. How has Christ fulfilled this? Or what has He fulfilled and what has He not fulfilled? And that's really one of the greatest dividing misconceptions in the body of Christ. And what churches have been divided over is what parts of the Torah, the law of Moses, what parts has Christ fulfilled and what parts has He not? I mean, for example... We, we, we read about in what's called the law of Moses, thou shalt not kill. And, and a lot of people say, we're not under the law anymore. So, let me ask you a question. So, is it okay to kill now? To murder? Is it okay to commit adultery or have false gods and false idols and to blaspheme the Sabbath and to dishonor your parents? And so a lot of people struggle with what has Christ fulfilled and what has He not. And obviously we can't break that down and explain that all in tonight's session, but we will deal with that in the future, how there are division of the laws that are in Moses' law, like ceremonial laws, laws of purification, laws of sanctification. And then there's just moral laws. I like to call it common sense laws. You know, how many of you know what the Word says that God would do after we're born of the Spirit. When we're born of the Spirit, we don't, we don't have to just have everything written down to know what's right and wrong. Right? 
He said he would write his laws, his instructions on our heart. And he would lead us and guide us into all truth. Think about what Jesus told his disciples uh, in the upper room the night that he's betrayed. He said, guys, it's more beneficial that I leave here and send you the Holy Spirit because if I go away and send you the Holy Spirit, He can lead you into all truth. In other words, He's saying, there there are things that you're not ready for me to tell you, but the good news is, I'm going to go away, you're going to mature, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and when you're ready, when you're mature enough, He will lead you into all truth. He will lead you into things that I would like to say now, but you just can't handle. Right? Right? So we need to understand the importance of the Old Testament and how it is the support, the foundation of the New Testament. And we need to rightly divide the word of truth. And the only way you can rightly divide the word of truth is how? By studying the Old Testament. That's the only way. Listen to what he goes on to say about the word. All scripture, this is referring to the Old Testament, is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I like to think about what Paul says, and it's this. It was our schoolmaster. It was our tutor. It was our teacher to bring us to a place in our life to where we would realize the most important thing we can realize, that we need Jesus, that we need a Savior, that all the laws that God had Moses record, they are impossible to keep them all. And James tells us this, if you trespass one of them, it's as if you've broken every single one of them. So you know what that does? The good news is for for someone who was good at sinning, they're in the same boat as the person who just sinned one time. Because if you break one, it's like you broke them all. You're guilt, guilty's guilty. Falling short of perfection is falling short. It don't matter how close you are to perfection, good's not good enough when you're dealing with perfection. And God is a perfect God. And only Christ could live the perfect life to fulfill the law, to walk out the commandments. I want you to think about it. Not only did he live a perfect life, but he lived a perfect life in the face of the greatest adversity that any single human being has ever faced. I mean, I want you to think about the religious people who tried to destroy his life countless times. They continually tried to trip him up. They accused him, and they set traps for him to fall in. And it would have been real easy to get out in the flesh if you would have been Jesus, right? And what a lot of people don't realize is Jesus was human being. (laughs) So that means he could have got in the flesh and sinned. But he didn't. And thank God for it. Right? Because he didn't, we're covered by his blood We're sanctified and redeemed. And we're here tonight talking about His goodness. And we're revealing Him through the Old Testament writings. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 5. He said, search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify me. Obviously the Scriptures here he's mentioning are those of the Old Testament. And he said, they are they which testify of me. He goes on to say a few verses later, For had you believed Moses, what did Moses write? For sure, what did he write? The first five books of the Bible, right? The Torah. For had you believed Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you would believe me. You have to understand who he's talking to. He's talking to people who have memorized these books. And he said, if you believed what Moses wrote, you would believe me because he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? 
So you see how even Jesus is connecting what he is teaching then about the kingdom of God and what all of the writers of the Old Testament had written leading up to that time. I want you to think about another example is in Luke's gospel when Jesus was resurrected and he's on the, the road to Emmaus. And he comes upon a handful of people who are walking with their heads down and he walks up and he's like, why are you all so down in the dumps? And they're like, are you a stranger? Did you not hear about this, this man Jesus? How he was a righteous man and doing all these great things and now he's dead and we don't know where his body is? I mean, and here's Jesus walking beside him. Really? And the Bible says, you know what Jesus did? He said he set them down and he started expounding on things about himself beginning at Moses, the Torah, and the prophets. And he revealed himself to them. Okay? So he was even trying to connect himself to the Old Testament. Now, we looked at this scripture several times, but it's very foundational for really why we're here and why we do this. It's taken from the book of Revelation, the unveiling of, of Jesus Christ. Literally, the revealing. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Well, we've already talked about it. Jesus was a Jew. He was talking to a Jew. And he would have been speaking in the Hebrew language, which would have went like this. I am Aleph. And we've talked extensively about what that is. I am Aleph and Tav. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. Now, And we've talked about this, how that he is the Aleph and the Tav, which is the first and last letter of the Hebrew Alephbet, which is at the core, at the base of how we get our writing, the Word of God, which John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we know because of verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That is talking about Jesus Christ. And we've looked at Genesis 1 and verse 1, how the Aleph Tov is there in the beginning, and how all creation flowed through the Aleph Tov, which is the Word of God, right? And that's foundational because the Word of God is what we stand on. It is our rock. It is our anchor. And it is our foundation that we're building upon. So everything that we say and do as believers is built on what? The Aleph Tov, the Word of God. Okay? So he's revealing that about himself. Now, every letter is important. From, from the Aleph to the Tav, the beginning of the sacrifices. Remember, the first sacrifice that was made was by God himself to cover the sins of Adam and Eve. Remember, it says he took the skins of animals and he clothed Adam and Eve. There's only one way to get the skins of an animal to clothe someone with. You have to take its life. And from, from the fall, humanity was to understand the value of life. And the value, really what happened as a result of the fall was what? death immediately an animal had to lose its life to cover the sins of Adam and Eve to clothe them to cover their nakedness okay so he is the he is the sacrifice that we read about in Genesis right but he's also the final sacrifice the beginning and the ending okay so we know it's not talking about as far as God having a beginning or an end because he's an infinite God but it's talking about him being the word of God and the fulfillment of the covenant in both the old and the new covenant that he literally fulfilled in and through himself by the shedding of his blood and we're going to kind of work our way around tonight to the concept of blood and the kingdom of God and being sons and daughters of God and we're going to see some neat little connections that I don't think are ironic. We'll just say that. So let's work our way towards that. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to 
fulfilled. Now, something you need to understand is our, our King James Bible or our English translations of the Bible in the New Testament are really not detailed enough. Because sometimes when you read a scripture like this, think not that I'm come to destroy the law. The word law there could be more defined based on the context. Sometimes the word law, when you read it in the New Testament, is talking about the first five books of the Bible. Sometimes the word law, when you see it in English in your New Testament, is talking about the entire Old Testament. And sometimes... When you see the word law in the New Testament, it is directly referring to what we call the the law of Moses or the Mosaic law. You need to understand this about the Old Testament. Okay? For 2,500 years, there was no law of Moses. Okay? When you read your Old Testament, for 2,500 years of the 4,000 years of time that is recorded in the Old Testament, for 2,500 years, there was no Mosaic law. So that entire span of time is not all under the law of Moses. Matter of fact, a thousand more years, 2,500 years, was not under the Mosaic law, and then the Mosaic law came at Mount Sinai to Moses and to the children of Israel, and for approximately 14, 1,500 years, they lived under the Mosaic law. So it's unfair to title the entire Old Testament as the Mosaic law because the majority of it was not even under the Mosaic law. Are you following me? And it's important to know the difference and only the context when you're reading your English Bible, will tell you whether he's referring to the Mosaic Law, whether he's referring to the the entire Old Testament, or what exactly is being referred to when the word law is used. Now he says, think not that I've come to destroy the law. In other words, he's saying, I didn't come to destroy the writings, the Torah, the instruction. That's literally what Torah means, instruction. Or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And he says that I'm going to fulfill it in such detail. Watch what he says. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Down to the very smallest letter and the smallest stroke of a pen, Jesus said, I am going to fulfill the law, the prophets in the writings of the Old Testament. So it's important to take into consideration all of it if he said he was going to fulfill it down to the very letter and the smallest stroke of a pen. Would you agree? I, I, I like what he says in Matthew 24 and verse 35 in the Olivet Discourse. He says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall never pass away. The Word of God is greater than the earth we live on and the heavens we look to. Because one day He is going to renovate the heavens and the earth with fire. But His Word remains the same. Peter said, It liveth and abideth and endureth forever. So, we see the value of every letter that's written in the law. And that's what's amazing about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because of, you know, you can't teach or preach without throwing a little bit of what you've been studying out there. And it's something that I've been studying a lot here lately is the Dead Sea Scrolls. And why the Dead Sea Scrolls is so important is because the oldest dating Hebrew manuscripts that we have of the Old Testament date to 1000 A.D. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found writings of the Hebrew Old Testament that predate the oldest Hebrew manuscripts we had by over 1,000 years. Why is that important? Because it can help get us closer to the original autographs, the original writings of the ones who penned the Word of God. And that's important, as we just see on the screen, every jot is going to be fulfilled so the more textual criticism we can do and the more we can look at the older documents and compare and 
and tune it down to what would be closest to the original, the closer we can get to understanding the God we serve. And I think that's very important. And that's something that I've been studying a lot. And I'm, I'm, just, I'm really enjoying it, to be honest with you. And I hope to share a lot of it with you, hopefully soon. Okay, let's look at a jot and a tittle. What you're looking at on your screen is the script that was pretty much used in Jesus' day. It's the Hebrew Aramaic script. They use the same script. And it has the entire Aleph Bet on there. And you'll look that it goes to this little letter here. And that is the jot. Or in Greek, iota. Or iota, literally. But that's where we get the, the phrase, not one iota. Because it is the smallest letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. And he said, I am going to fulfill it down to the smallest letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. Not only is he going to fulfill it down to the smallest letter, which is the Jot, the Yod, he's going to fulfill it to the tittle. And this is what a tittle is in reference to what Jesus said in that day. I want you to look at these arrows. See what that arrow is pointing to? The little, smallest little Looks like an itty bitty little horn or, or like a scorpion tail. That is a tittle. Just the smallest variation or stroke of a pen. And I have two, two words on the screen because you're going to see the importance of a tittle and these two words and how if you confuse the two, which is very easy to do uh, in textual criticism and in scribes translating uh, the originals, uh, it can change the meaning drastically, and sometimes it could, it could throw you off track doctrinally. But I want you to look. The first word here is acher, and it means another. The word below it, notice that the first letter is the same, the second letter is the same, and the third letter looks very similar. When writing it with a pen, it is you have to look very close to see the difference. You can see it in this particular font. You can see the difference quite a bit better. But I want you to notice this is a resh, how it's just smooth, curved over, and this is a dalit, kind of curves back. Do you see the difference? That is a tittle. That minute difference in the stroke of a pen can change drastically the interpretation of a scripture. And I have an example for you. The most famous Scripture probably in the, in the Old Testament uh, for, for the Hebrew people for sure. It, it literally says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, or Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Notice that we have one of the words there we looked at at the previous slide. If you was to mess up on the tittle of this and make it smooth like the first word we seen well ago, it would read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is another God. Which would lead Israel and anyone who reads the writing to believe that there's not just one God, there are other gods, there are many gods, and how many of you believe that would be getting way off track doctrinally? But he specifically says, the Lord our God is one Lord. There is only one supreme God who is the creator, who is above all gods, all deities, all angels, all principalities. There is one creator and one uh, originator, author of all of life, and that is Yahweh, the one true God. But if you was to mess up with the stroke of a pen, you could have it say there are other gods or there are many gods, more than one gods, and then that would open the, the door for deception, wrong doctrine, wrong teaching, and you could get off track. So that's the importance of the jot and the tittle. While we're on the subject of one, I want to kind of take a different direction and show you uh, some things in the book of Genesis and show you some things about man and woman as husband and wife, the building of a home by having children and fulfilling the commandment of God to procreate and to multiply and fill the earth. So let's look at Genesis chapter number 2. It says, Therefore 
shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, literally in Hebrew, it's the word that means woman or wife, and they shall be one flesh. And we're going to see the importance of oneness or unity becoming one because we are created in the image of God who is what we just read is one, right? So let's look at it in the Hebrew text. And I'll, I need a volunteer to uh, read that and parse that for me. <laughs> okay, nobody? It says, Al kin ya'azav ish et aviv ve'et imo ve'davak ve'ishto ve'hayu levasar echad. It literally is what we just read. It says, Upon thus shall a man leave or literally abandon his father and his mother and cleave to his wife and it will be for them flesh of one, one flesh. And it's important to understand that because when a man and a woman comes together, there is no greater example of the Godhead or the oneness of God than a married couple who are both in love with God. We are the image of God. In other words, when people see our marriages, that should be the closest thing that they see on this earth to seeing God. Because listen to me, when God created mankind... That included male and female. When God created His image, when he, when he put a replica of Himself on this planet, He didn't just put Adam on this earth. It was a married couple. So the image of God and the complete portrayal of God is a married couple. Okay? Okay? And it's very important to understand that. And that's why I believe the enemy has attacked in such a great way the home and the marriage. Because it is a, the image of God. And it is what he goes after harder than anything else. And I believe it's something that we should guard as number one priority other than our relationship with God should be our relationship with our spouse. Can I get an amen? Amen. I know i got two back there for sure. So God created man. See that word man? We're going to see here in just a moment that, that that's not referring to just the male species. That is the word for mankind. Ha'adam. And we'll see that. We'll look at the Hebrew text here in just a moment. And I'll show you that it's not talking about the man, Adam. It's talking about the human race. So God created humankind in His own image in the image of God, created he him. Male and female, created he them. Okay? Let's look at it in the Hebrew. It says, Vayivra Elohim, and, and God created et hadam. Have you ever called yourself the, like, you introduce, I'm the Daniel? Right? I am the Daniel Smith. That's weird, isn't it? That's awkward. Well, this is how we know right here, if you look at this word, Ve'yivra Elohim et ha'adam. You see this letter right here that is before Adam? It's the letter He. In Hebrew, that means the. It's the definite article. Like we put the in front of words that we want to identify. Well, in Hebrew, you simply just put the letter he and it means the. So it literally means, and God created the human race. The human race. Not just the man, because in the man was male and female, right? So it says, V'yivra Elohim et adam Betzalmo, in his image. Betzalem, Elohim bara oto, zachar u nekiva bara otam. 
In his image, God created him. Male and female created he them. So the human race is not just the male species. Right? Because without the woman, life will not continue. Right? Because what, what does the Bible even say about Eve? She is the mother of all living. Right? Okay. So it's important to see that the image of God is not just man. It's man and his wife as one. Okay? Let's move forward. Man and woman. I want to show you some neat things that I don't think are coincidental that will, will show us the importance of how we bear the image of God. So follow with me. Man and woman, the word for man in Hebrew is the word ish. Aleph, yud, shin. Okay? The word ish. The word for woman is isha. Aleph, shin, hey. What's interesting in and this jumps out immediately if you've done any study in Hebrew, is that the man bears a yod and the woman's name bears a hey. When you put yod and hey together, what do you have? The sacred name of God. Yah. Hallelujah, which is a shortened version for the sacred name of God. Yah. So it shows us here that to have the full image of God, to bear the image of God, man and woman have to come together to give us the name of God. And that's why it's important to have God center of our relationship and our marriage if we are going to be a definite portrayal of Him here on this earth when people see our marriage. Now, let me show you what happens if you were to take the image of God out. Okay? Or take God out. You got Ish, Isha. What if you took those two letters out? Took the Yud and the He. You can see it in the white letters. Note it, do you notice anything similar about this line and this line? Without the orange letters? It's the Aleph and Sheen. It's the same. That's the Hebrew word Ish. Does anybody know what that word is? It's fire. You know what you get when you take God out of your home and out of your marriage? You're not left with fire. You're left with double fire. But if you're both following God and you b both love God first and foremost, you will be the closest thing to the image of God that people see here on this earth with you and your spouse. All right, let's move on. Let's move to the command that God gave husband and wife. It says in verse 28 of Genesis 1, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So the first thing that God told His creation, His image to do, was what? Make more images. Alright? Procreate. Be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the earth. And honestly, this is my opinion, uh, I honestly believe that had Adam and Eve not fail, they singly would have filled the earth, just the two of them, because they would have been infinite and eternal. They would have never died and brother and sister would have never had to marry. That's just my opinion, but take it for what it's worth. I think Adam and Eve could have populated the entire earth without any of their children having to marry and have kids themselves. Okay? So, but the fall messed that up. Now, what do we call a man and a woman who come together and are fruitful and they multiply? They, they're no longer just a man and a woman or a husband and a wife. What are they? What would be the names of each of them? Yeah, it's not a trick question. Dad and mom. In, in any language, dad and mom, okay? 
Y'all thought it was some deep theological surprise. Okay, let's look at it. We've, we've, we've talked about it before, but the word picture for, for father is aleph and bet. It's the Hebrew word av, and it literally means the strength or leader of the house. And I think the Bible has supported that definition of what a father is to be. He is the strength, he is the leader, he is the spiritual leader of the house. Okay, the mother, am, is strong water, which is like glue in that culture, or the first blood, the one who continues on uh, the blood line of the family. And that's the word am. Okay, are you all with me so far? Let's look at something that's really neat. Something about these letters, if you'll remember, and hopefully you brought your hand out with you, they're not only letters, but they're also they're also word pictures, but numbers. Every one of these has a numerical value from 1 to 400. And that's why you see uh, it mentioned in the book of Revelation, number, the number of the beast, it's the number of man, etc., etc., because of what's called gematria, which we have a related word that we use called geometry. And I, I want to give caution to you. Don't get caught up in that or a lot of the Bible codes, especially if you don't know Hebrew because you could get led down a path that would could just uproot you and just mess up, mess up your faith, okay? So I don't want you to get too caught up in it, but I want to show you some neat little things that I don't think are coincidental and I think we'll see some of the handiwork of God in this. So let's look at it. The word av, aleph and bet, is the numerical value 1 and 2. 1 and 2. If you have your printout, you can look at it, which equals 3. Okay? We're talking about procreating, filling the earth. Keep that in mind. Mother is M, which is Aleph is 1. Mem is 40. That equals 41. When, when they come together, father and mother come together, you have... 3 and 41, which is what? 44, okay? You have the value of 44. What's amazing is when you have a child or when a woman gives birth, you have a root word in Hebrew. It's the, it's the root word yalad, literally to bring forth, to give birth, or it's also the word for child, yelad, okay? And it is spelt this way, yud, lamed, dalet. When you look at the numerical value of that, the yud is 10, the lama is 30, the dollar is 4, you have 44. So when mother and father come together, you have the value of 44. And when they have a child, when she gives birth, and you take the same root that is based on the numbering system, you have the same number. So you have av, plus M is 44, and then Yelid, which is child, is 44. Now, maybe you think that's a coincidence, but I don't. Let's take it one step further. In Hebrew, the word for blood is the word dam. How many of you know, in the Old Testament, what does blood represent? Life. Leviticus says that the life is in the blood. That's why it's sacred, and that's why the Bible commands not to eat blood. Because it is what atones. Without the shedding of blood, there is what? No remission of sins. Right? So blood's very important for life. And we're going to see how this connects to the born again experience and how we are sons and daughters of God. Okay? Notice that the numerical value of blood is dalit, which is 4, man, which is 40 which equals 44, which is the same as when a father and mother come together, and it's the same as child. So to be a child, what, what is the life source of the child? Blood. What's in the blood? DNA. Let me ask you a question. How many chromosomes do you have? 46. But how many regular chromosomes do you have? 
Y'all didn't know I was this smart, did you? You have 22 autosomes, chromosomes from your father. You have 22 autosomes from your mother. And then you have an X or an XY, which are allosomes, which determine the sex. But your, the base makeup of your DNA is 44 which is in your blood. Think that's all coincidental that, that that all comes out together? Maybe, but I, I kind of think it don't because I think God's a very detailed God. So in our DNA, we have all of this connecting together. We have the birth, the blood, which is the life. Let me ask you a question. How do you become a son or a daughter of God? John chapter 3, except you be born from above, experience a what? A new birth, you can't see the kingdom of God. Well, let me ask you another question that kind of will go with what we've been looking at. How are you born from above? How are you born again? But for the blood of Jesus, we'd all be sinners. It's only through the blood that we become sons and daughters and become part of the family and part of the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? So unless we are born of the Spirit or born from above, and you can only be born from above by and through the blood and the atonement of Jesus, therefore you are a son of God, just like you're a son or daughter of your earthly parent, and you carry their DNA. When you are born into the kingdom of God, you're adopted by a new parent, right? And it only happens through the blood. Let me show you something as we advance in our understanding as believers Jesus said in John chapter 8, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him. Those Jews which believed on Him. In other words, Jews that believed He was the Messiah. If you continue in My Word, then you are My disciples indeed, or literally the word disciples there is tell me deem, which means students. If you continue in my word, then you're my students indeed. And why why is that so important? Why is it so important? And why do we stress at this church the importance of the word of God and the preaching of the word of God and getting in the word of God? Right here. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. There's only one way to get free. It's not through goosebumps and spiritual calisthenics. It's by the living Word of God. Knowing the truth, getting the truth down in you, will set you free. And you will walk in freedom. Okay? Let's look at the word truth in Hebrew. It's the word emet. I want you to notice what that word consists of. Now, we've looked at the masculine form of this word, which is all man. This is the feminine form of the word, which is used like when Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, the way, the truth, and the life. This is the word that would have been used. So what Jesus was saying is, notice the letters that it's connected. It's Aleph, Mem, and Tav. You know what the truth is that sets you free? I want you to look at the screen. It's when you see that both covenants are sealed in the blood. The blood of Jesus. That's the truth that sets us free. The truth that every single one of us needs a Savior. And He is the fulfillment. He is the Aleph Tav that shed His blood that has brought us the truth of God's Word, that has revealed and fulfilled all things so that we can be 
in a covenant relationship with Him so that we can be sons and daughters, so that we can be born of the Spirit, born from above, and in the kingdom of God. He is the truth. Now, we're going to end by doing this one thing. On the screen, you'll see the alphabet. There are several of you who have asked me, how do you pronounce each of these letters? So, for those of you who have been wanting to know how to pronounce these letters, I want you to follow the screen. Remember, Hebrew reads from right to left, right? Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit, He, Vav, Zain, Chet, Tet, Yud, Kaf, or Chaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samech, Ein, Pe, or Fe, Tzadik, Kuf, Resh, Shen, and Tav.